Hi, welcome to this first in a series of bite-sized videos on psychometrics. Uh, today we're going to be talking about item response theory, or IRT. Uh, this is a modern psychometric paradigm that's used to design, develop, and analyze tests uh, to ensure that they're fair and accurate and have uh, extensive validity documentation. documentation. It's used by the best exams in the world. Uh, a lot of the large scale and high quality assessments use IRT and for good reason. Uh, we'll talk about a really uh, brief intro of the theory behind IRT before talking about some of those reasons. So let's get into it. So first, what is IRT? Well, IRT is a theory of mathematical functions that model the responses of examinees to test items or questions, hence the name item response theory. These functions are called item response functions. In some older literature, they're also called item characteristic curves or trace lines, but mostly now they're called item response functions or IRS. We use them to describe how a test item works, um, but it goes far, far beyond that. And these uh, IRFs are used for a lot of other things too that answer a lot of the really big questions that psychometric psychometricians have. Uh, so it's going to be used to do some advanced things like develop adaptive tests, computerized adaptive tests, or CAT, um, as well as uh, develop some additional functions like conditional standard error of measurement or the test information function. So this item response function looks like the graph you see on the right there. Um, and what this does is it reflects the probability of getting a response as a function of the latent trait or ability, uh, which is kind of on a z-score uh, metric. Um, so that's why you see on the bottom there, it's the, this is called theta, psychometricians call theta. Um, and it runs from about minus four to plus four, minus three to plus three, depending on how I do want to make the, um, the range, where zero is average and plus one is about one standard deviation above the mean and minus two is two standard deviations below the mean. Uh, though some uh, IRT models can differ in how they calibrate this. Uh, and what this graph here is saying that is uh, a person of average ability with a theta of zero has about a 70% chance of getting this item correct. And a top student, um, which is you know a z-score or theta of two, which is 99th percentile, has about a 98% chance of getting it correct. And a low student at minus two, which is about the um, first or second percentile, has a, about a 30% um, chance of getting it correct. So this kind of makes sense if you just look at it and think of it in those ways. Um, the reason it tails off to 0.25 um, depends upon the type of model you're doing, but in this case, it's representing a four option multiple choice question. You've got a one in four chance of, ch one in four chance of guessing it, which is 25%, hence that curve uh, flattening off at 0.25 rather than going all the way down to zero. Um, but in a lot of assessments, that might be the case. Like if you're um, typing in a response, it's a short answer, it's not multiple choice, then there's no guessing, and that whole idea doesn't just make sense. Uh, there's a lot of other statistics here that go as well, um, which we won't be talking about as part of this uh, quick presentation. So this curve is defined by three parameters called A, B, and C, uh, though they actually work in a, a different order. B is the first one, A is the second one, and C is the third one. So if you have a one parameter model, it only uses B, it doesn't use A, it just uses B. Uh, so the A parameter represents the discrimination of the item, uh, which determines how well it's differentiating examinees. Um, and uh, this is kind of like the slope of the curve at the center. So if it's got a steeper slope in that curve, it's got more discrimination. Uh, difficulty parameter represents how easy or hard the item is with respect to the examinees. Um, and this slides that whole curve left or right along that um, graph that I showed you before. Uh, so that if the curve is centered on zero, like it was in the example, that means it's appropriate for average examinees. But in a really easy question, that curve would be slid all the way to the left. You know, it would be centered around minus two or minus three. Um, and that represents that the item is appropriate for students that are at minus two or minus three. And the C parameter uh, is called the pseudo guessing parameter or the guessing parameter. And it's the base probability of answering the question as a lower asymptote, like my example there with the 25% chance of guessing. It's sometimes gonna be present, sometimes not gonna be present, and it's not always gonna be 0.25. Um, like even if you have a four option multiple choice question and your data um, software uh, says, oh, this question has a, a C of 0.33, that means that candidates are ignoring one of the four options and they're guessing amongst the other three. Uh, so that one option is pretty worthless. Uh, so this can actually provide some good information about the item it is performing. So these parameters can differ between items. They're not always going to be the same. Uh, so here's an example of four uh, or five quite different items. 
Uh, item number one uh, in the dark blue is a super easy item. It's at minus two. So you can see there that somebody at the minus two has about a 50% chance of getting it correct. Um, and even an average person at zero has about a 97, 98% chance of getting it correct because this is a very easy item. On the other hand, the light blue question is very difficult. Uh, somebody at average ability at zero only has like a 25% chance of getting it correct. Um, and even a top student of plus two, which is like the 90th, 99th percentile, they only got a 70% chance of getting it correct because this is a very, very difficult item. And that green line there shows that what happens if the slope is low. You can see that the slope is a lot lower, so the discrimination is not as good for that question. Um, and uh, that purple one there uh, just shows what it's like if there's no lower asymptote, um, and that it goes all the way down to zero, like if it's a, a short answer question. Another example where that makes sense is if you're dealing with um, non-cognitive assessments, like uh, yes-no questions or true-false questions, um, uh, perhaps in personality, like I like, go to, I like to go to parties if it's an extroversion survey. Um, they're going to say true or false or yes or no. There's no guessing to that question. So having no asymptote makes sense there. So there's actually three major types of families in item response theory. Um, there's the dichotomous, which deal with data that is yes or no, or right or wrong, or true false. Uh, note that this includes multiple choice, even though there's four answers, it's still scored yes or no, or right or wrong. There's polydomous, which are items that are scored with um, three or more points. So if you've worked with Likert exams, Likert, or sorry, Likert items is the correct way to say it, um, where rate, you say rate this on a scale of one to five, um, that is a polydomous, that's a part, uh, a rating scale uh, model. Partial credit models are like if you're scoring an essay on a score of zero to five, um, that would be appropriate for a partial credit model. And then there's special IRT models too that can integrate response time, uh, make uh, uncheatable personality assessments with ideal point models into multiple dimensions at once. And there's also something called facets, which looks at teasing apart um, uh, essay prompts versus rater severity and other things that can go into um, the, the special situation of scoring essays. So a quick co comparison here of classical test theory, which is the old way of doing assessment. It's been around for more than a, a century versus IRT, which has pretty much only been around since uh, the 1970s. Classical test theory has several weaknesses. One is that it's sample dependent. Um, so it depends upon the sample that you use to uh, do the initial validation of a test. Uh, it is test form dependent. A lot of the statistics used in classical test theory only work with that given form of the test and don't translate to other forms of the test. And if you've got multiple forms, um, that is a problem. Uh, it's got pretty weak linking and equating. So if you've got multiple forms, you can't like put them on the same scale to make sure that things are still uh, consistent across the forms, uh, which is you know a major issue for a lot of large scale exams that you know might deliver twice a year for. 10 years, and you want to link those all back to each other so that you've got consistent scores over time. Uh, classical test theory is very poor at vertical scaling. So if you're doing K-12 assessment and you want to have um, items or people scaled all the way from first grade up to 12th grade, can't really do that with classical, but IRT is pretty good at it. Um, IRT puts items and people onto the same scale, which classical test theory doesn't. It actually is reverse scales in classical test theory. Um, and that makes adaptive testing very difficult to do with classical test theory, but it's, um, it's relatively easy to do with item response theory. Classical test theory does not account for guessing, and we showed you that, that IRT does in some cases. And classical test theory oversimplifies a lot of things psychometrically. Uh, for example, it says reliability is going to be the same for all examinees that see a test. Well, if you think about it, um, that's not realistic because, you know, if all your items are average difficulty, um, you're, aver you're measuring the average students very well, and you've got no items of top difficulty, you're not measuring the top students very well. Um, and uh, IRT tries to find ways around this and some other important uh, distinctions among uh, the psychometric theory behind things. So some of the ways that you differ between classical test theory and IRT are shown here. Um, the IRT model is usually logistic. Classical test theory is based off linear assumptions. Uh, the difficulty uh, statistic in classical test theory is the p-value, proportion correct, whereas it's the b parameter in IRT. Um, the p-value is actually really easy to interpret. It's very simple, um, easy to talk to with SMEs about. Um, b is more difficult to uh, deal with, but it uh, has a lot of advantages psychometrically. And the same for the discrimination, the guessing parameter. Now, one important uh, distinction is that uh, multiple choice uh, calibration with IRT 
uh, collapses it from the four options to the yes or no or correct and correct like we talked about, uh, which means it doesn't provide distractor analysis. So you still have to have classical test theory in your software to do this distractor analysis. IRT also has a lot of um, uh, indices around fit and dimensionality and other more advanced psychometric things that are useful. Um, and it has a completely different idea of reliability and precision that better matches uh, how things actually work psychometrically. So uh, regarding uh, that, that last uh, point I made about uh, not having distractor analysis, most psychometric software uh, that does IRT will also give you classical test theory results. So here's an example from our Excalibur software. You can see I've got PN RP biz there. Uh, those are the typical classical difficulty discrimination, um, whereas IRT is then presented below with A, B, and C. Um, so most software will present both like this and it's best practice to do so. Now, why does all this matter? Why are we adding all this complexity? Uh, why are we um, uh, developing a whole new paradigm here? Well, IRT is used for a bunch of different things in psychometrics. It's used to evaluate item performance. It's used to evaluate test performance, such as standard error and test information functions. Uh, it's used to score examinees. We're no longer scoring examinees based on the number of items they get correct alone. Uh, we use the item uh, response uh, functions. Uh, IRT is, produces much stronger form assembly, especially if you're trying to make parallel forms. IRT drives the uh, algorithms behind adaptive testing and linear on the fly testing to make those much more efficient and defensible. IRT does equating and scaling, um, especially the vertical scaling that I mentioned. Uh, IRT has ways of providing data forensics to look for cheating or um, bad person fit or other potential issues. Um, and IRT uh, provides a lot of strong support for validity and dimensionality documentation as well. Now, when you think about it in terms of psychometrics, that's just about everything that we want to do. You know, we're evaluating items, we're evaluating tests, we're trying to compare scores across years. Um, uh, we're trying to develop algorithms to make the test smarter. IRT underpins all of these, which is why it's so important for some of these organizations that use it. And that's why I say it's a psychometric paradigm. It's not just a theory. It's a whole way of thinking about how we're going to design, develop, deliver, and analyze our tests. So because of that, IRT has to be baked into a lot of the work that you're doing. It's not like you're just going to run an IRT analysis on IRT software at the end of the year and just call, call it quits after that. Um, you've got to build this into other aspects of what you're doing. So an example here that I'm showing is a screen from our item making software in that you're storing both the classical test theory on the left and the item response theory on the right. Um, because uh, you need to have these item response theory parameters in there so that you can use them for assembly test forms to ensure that they're parallel or maybe if you're making adaptive tests, these IRT parameters have to be in there because you're delivering adaptive tests and they're part of the calculations. Um, so you have to bake this into that uh, the item making proportion and the test assembly proportion and publishing portion of your assessment platform. Um, it also has to be as part of the engine if you're delivering uh, adaptive tests or linear on the fly tests or even linear tests that are scored with IRT. Um, IRT has to be baked into the test delivery engine. Uh, and then afterwards, it has to be baked into the scoring algorithms, the reporting, um, uh, the feedback uh, that's provided to students, all that kind of thing. And then you also want to have analysis software too. So here's an example of our analysis software, Excalibur, uh, that can provide these IRT analyses. And you can see it gives you uh, easy radio buttons there to choose which type of model you want to do. Because like I said before, some data works very well uh, with some uh, types of models and vice versa. So that's a really quick overview of the response theory. Uh, it's actually, uh, it takes much, much more to get into all the different topics. We'll follow up with some other videos on some of those more specific things like how scoring works or what are polydomous models. Uh, but we're going to leave those for another day because uh, IRT is a, a really complex, expansive topic. Uh, there are entire courses, like it's, it's worth more, uh, more than a single semester course at a graduate level. Um, and there's many books on it as well, too. Uh, so we'll uh, come back to some of those other more specific topics, those niche topics later, and just want to provide an overview here if you're new to the idea of item response theory. Thank you.